Berlin as a metaphor. The great industrial tradition of Berlin, that at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, no longer exists. Hitler blocked the natural path of the capitalist metropolis, forcing industrialists into flight, the war raised it to the ground, and the wall split it into two sectors. After the fall of the wall, we had a virgin territory which had to adapt to the necessities of international economics. Thus, it became a great laboratory in which I, through the development of architecture, thought, became conscious and judged. Urban development is a great metaphor for understanding the tendencies of contemporary society. It is moreover possible to project bridges to follow the traces which lead towards this web of economic interests, which extends itself particularly eastwards. The geography. Berlin is situated in the centre of two economic, political, social and cultural spheres. The post-Catholic Keynesian Western world and the classic neo-capitalism in the style of Ricardo Adam Smith of the Eastern countries. In the Western countries, profit arises from the decentralisation and the rationalisation of labour. The modern legal state guarantees the mobility of labour and stimulates the production of capital through the control of public spending. In the eastern countries, profits arise in a particular way through the use of low-cost mass labour. Mobility is limited and the state tends to intervene as little as possible in public spending. After the wall. After the fall of the wall, Berlin regained her strategic, economic and historical position. The architecture submits to the economy and through chessboard urbanization prepares for the sort of dynamic flow required in Western yeah. profit. The new economic flow. Obviously the economic flow cannot circulate in the way it did before Hitler came to power. Berlin has no need to organize herself as a center of production with heavy industry and workers quarters. In the 70s capital understood this already. The economy had to lose its whale-like qualities as the whales were becoming ill, were surrendering, were starting to become extinct. The destruction of the large factories and financial system had begun. When Nixon freed the dollar from the gold standard in the 70s, he made financial flexibilization and decentralization possible, increasing profits thanks to inflation. At the same time, industry began to decentralize in order to protect itself from the rising wages of mass labor, which gained political and economic power through the ability of the workers to organize themselves. This in turn was made possible by the large number of workers on a single site. Decentralization. 
From the 70s to the present day, the transformation of our economic system has been gigantic. Production has become completely decentralised and dislocated. Industry is no longer centred around large cities and less located in third world countries where labour is extremely cheap. Everything necessary to construct a car is produced in different places and in small and medium sized workshops. Close one and the other continues to work. Paradox. As I've already mentioned, a large slice of production occurs in eastern countries where labour is very cheap. Thus, yeah, profits yeah. grow enormously, while the buying power of the labour force in western countries decreases due to the growing unemployment caused by the absence of local production. This is a dangerous game. If the demand sinks too far due to consumers' lack of money, who should buy all the products produced in Asia? With a wage of $150 a month, an average Chinese worker can hardly buy a Mercedes costing $25,000. And there is an increase in demand. Why does the investment curve not sink? And why do the profits in industry continue to rise? Capitalism is an intelligent and extremely intuitive beast. On the other hand, capitalism is not so stupid as to allow its internal paradoxes to self-destruct. In 200 years of survival, the economy of profit has demonstrated the ability to react with great cunning and swiftness to all possible catastrophes within its system. So, how does modern capitalism control the disequilibrium in the market between demand and supply? There are three factors which control the disequilibrium of the market. Firstly, the wages of the workers in eastern countries rise and thus also their spending power. In addition to this, the riches of a certain partly criminal elite increase the demand of luxury products. Finally, part of the western workforce is drawn into middle class jobs concerned with the organisation and coordination of the economy at a higher salary, causing increased construction of offices and the infrastructure of information technology by cable and satellite. The technology. A very relevant factor which has made the decentralization and relocation of industry possible is science and technology. Only through the computerization of communications did a delocated profit oriented economy become possible, which has superseded the limitations of the classic parameter space, time and the pre digital era. Then transport took longer, production control had to take place on the spot, international money transfers were slow. Production was tied to the presence of masked workers. Now, seated at a computer in an office, it is possible to coordinate production, project planning, consumption, sales information, distribution and exchange in any part of the world. Information and psychology of mass consumption, totalitarian democracy, internet, purpose and means information medium, consumption and production of information. A sure way of avoiding the development of opposition to the system is to encourage the belief that nothing exists which is worth organising that will make him move away from it. 
The modern information, political, religious and economic system declares itself to be extremely democratic and free of any censorship whatsoever. Everybody seems free to receive information through the various media, from the classic media such as books and libraries, newspapers and magazines, television, radio and video, otherwise through the modern medium of the computer. It even seems as though liberty of communication has increased so much that for the first time in the history of information it is potentially and to an extent practically possible for many individuals to produce and consume messages at the same time using the same technological means. Using the internet it is possible to produce electronic pages containing texts and images instantly and at a very low cost in almost every corner of the world and insert them into a global web making them accessible to every individual who's attached to the internet. While the information system appears extremely informative, in reality is extremely disinformative. Misinformation no longer arises from falsified demagogic content and news. This is an old method used exclusively by authoritarian systems of the past. But through the digital system's mystification of the image and the means distributing the message. The Factor, Speed and Truth The message composed of images is an agglomeration of electronic bits which unlike images in analog, magnetic or chemical form on video cassette, camera or cinema film can be manipulated perfectly, making it impossible, even through perfect analysis, to guarantee its authenticity. In addition, the extreme speed of production, preparation, and lastly emission makes a qualitative selection impossible for the user, refining themselves in a situation of total loss of verification, with a complete lack of sensory experience, of sight, touch, and taste. This absorbs the message without reflecting upon it, Furthermore, it is possible, or at least difficult, to climb the source of the message to verify whether it is fit to consume. The Virtual Democracy the economy of profit exploiting technology is thus able to create an atmosphere of virtual democracy, degrading the consciousness of the consumer into a sort of virtual RAM memory, capable only of memorizing transitory data necessary for the sustainment and survival of the system in a transitory way. Total control of the individual allows inextensional needs to be formed and thus demand for superfluous useless goods. Total control also acts on the political consciousness, the sense of being able to make choices for and against, such as to be able to realise a change of position inside the government and society is instilled. This is also a virtual option, as the polarised system of political parties are simply different in form and not in content. In fact, any party which is constitutional must accept the profit orientated economic system. Furthermore, every mass party must by definition live from mass votes, and the mass is the conformist, normalised, agglomerate formed by the system of misinformation which the economy uses to consolidate its power. Information does not work as a means of stimulating the intellectual capacity of the individual, but becomes a tool for guaranteeing a system of power and complex interest orientated towards the rules of profit. Efficiency. The profit economy uses communications technology in a very effective way. Information is not produced by a central power, but by many powers, which could represent, for example, the names of the companies present in the list of the international stock exchanges. Even though they compete amongst each other, these powers show extreme solidarity when deciding who should survive and how the total control over the social life of the nations should be enforced. 
Furthermore, they have the readiness, flexibility and mobility to respond also militarily to the inherent problems of controlling the world dominion. The urban development of Berlin. Architecture is not autonomous, only extremely rarely. In any case, the great works of architecture, those valid from a human and artistic point of view, are subjected to their function of evoking pleasure in the eye and the soul in the same way it occurs with a painting by a prestigious painter hung in an office in Tokyo. The urban configuration of Berlin is encaptured in the economic necessity of coordinating the world profit production through the construction of offices. The giants of production are not building industries but managerial centres for presentation. What the urbanists thought Immediately after the fall of the wall, the urbanists imagined a vertical demographic increase, an influx of population out of the Dimitrov zones into the city towards the big industry. Nothing could be further from the truth. Keynesian post-capitalism no longer needs factories with thousands of workers living in peripheral estates. Today the profit arises from teams of employees of various levels of specialization whose task it is to seat themselves at the computer and organize the production. The demographic flow towards the city is thus limited by this logic. The citizens use the structures, parks, theatres, cinemas, railway stations, libraries, internet, fitness studios, swimming pools, schools, universities, pubs, concert halls, brothels, video libraries, hospitals and so on to guarantee themselves biological and vegetable survival. Chessboard architecture, profit-oriented economy that which only apportions value to goods and not to the use which is made of them is not interested in ethics and human needs and even less in the progressive ideas which were the origin of a functional architecture of Bauhaus or better, that which is known as chessboard architecture. The thesis of chessboard architecture saw man in harmony with a functional economic system which stimulated and improved the human dimension. The harmony between nature and transformed nature, between human beings, between man and work, should become true for the use of rationality, i.e. mathematics and logic, thus not be contradictory, should use the deductive method to try and find those forms and contents which are in a position to resolve the disequilibrium produced by capitalism. There were three problems which the theoreticians of rationalism, such as Le Cabusier, Gropius, Elta Wright, had not considered. One, reality is extremely complex and it is impossible to capture it in a mathematical deductive system because the enormous variability would constantly contradict the coherence of the internal logical form. With all good intentions, it is impossible to design buildings, states, cities, without taking into account and living the anthropological, psychological, historical aspects of the people who will populate them. 2. The profit economy is amoral, not interested in any ideals which cannot be valued in terms of goods. 3. As long as the profit economy rules, every urbanization process is completed within it, insofar as the investment by definition only takes place internally within this economic logic without which not a single crane would move. At the moment the power of the exchange of money is winning and the excluded third sabotage and reaching consciousness. Cogito ergo sunt. 
We are not passive observers. We think analog. We become conscious of what is happening. We look inside and transform the negative into positive. We do not let ourselves be trapped in the logic of the yes or no, true or false. We think and thus we judge.